So welcome. I include that to myself because I'm still, I don't know about everybody else, but I'm a bit groggy after the Christmas and I hurt my back as well. So I'm setting an example about how many cushions is allowable because I've got about four. So um, please do make sure you're comfortable here today. You don't have to sort of do anything aesthetic. It's all about kindness, being compassionate to the aches and the pains and treating them as friends and not as things to be overcome. So um, I'm not sure how many of you have been on retreats before or how many are complete newcomers. If there are any newbies here, could you stick your hand up? Yay. Okay. So I think um, the reason I chose this topic today, it's a little bit of an obscure title between the knower and the known or the knowing and the known. Sounds a little bit strange, perhaps, but the main reason I chose it is because we all have most of us, quite a lot of different meditation practices and experiences. And some of you may, you know, have not done any meditation before. But the most important thing in every practice is not what you do and what you're aware of, but how you're aware of that. Yeah? So it's always about a relationship. If you think of life, the whole of life is relational. And, you know, the difference that we make in our relationships is not necessarily with whom we have them, but how we treat the person involved, how we treat our own mind, our own thoughts, our own body. Yeah, so it's, this is where the freedom lies. This is where we have a little bit of influence over our experience because we can't control life, you know. Things happen that we don't expect. We do our back in on Christmas Day, you know. <laughs> or things happen. People die at very inconvenient times. You know, we lose our job. So many difficult things happen in life and, and we can't control that. And a lot of the suffering is in trying to control the uncontrollable. Yeah, but what we can have a little bit of influence about is how we relate to the things that do happen. And that includes you know, any experience, it includes our own mind and moods and emotions, and even our meditation objects. Yeah? So being kind doesn't only mean to being kind to animate beings, it can also mean being kind to inanimate things. You know, we can even develop feelings of kindness and gratitude towards our own meditation cushions, yeah? or towards the chocolate biscuits upstairs. <laughs> part of that involves how many you take but generally we want to develop this very beautiful attitude towards our practice which is not one about what can I get out of the practice but more what am I bringing to it what kind of qualities do I want to develop in my heart <clears throat> and bring to the meditation thank you very much and so this idea of um, between the knowing and the known is really talking about a sort of space, like an imaginary space perhaps, but sometimes we're so close to our experience that we're just responding, we're reacting to it without thinking. And the idea here is that there's trying to make a little bit of space between what we're aware of and what's doing the, aware, the being aware, if you like. So if you imagine that there's a kind of space in between the two and this is where the relationship happens. So what are we putting into that space? You know, when you close your eyes and you see a wandering mind or you see your breath, which is maybe a little bit uh, fast because you're anxious or nervous about being here, you've not quite settled, that's, that's one thing. But what are you putting in between those two? Is there a resistance? Is there a sense of frustration with it or wanting to control it, wanting to calm it down? Or is there a feeling of like acceptance and kindness, maybe patience? Yeah, and the Buddha called these uh, right attitudes the three right intentions. And that is right at the beginning of the Eightfold Path. So the first factor of the path is to have right view. And right view, to some extent, implies understanding that there is suffering. You know, there is a certain amount of suffering in any, anybody's life. And some of it we can you know, ameliorate, but some of it we can't control. But that suffering has a cause and that there's a way out of that by removing the cause. Yeah? So this, this is kind of the view or the understanding that gives us the motivation to find a way out, yeah? to start seeking a different way. And that naturally leads into, okay, how, do I, how should I be in this world? How should I manifest in a way that doesn't create more suffering and that actually helps to alleviate suffering? So, of course, when you understand that you, know, you are fragile, you're human, you're vulnerable, and other people also are, then there's a wish, there's a natural wish to be kind. Yeah, and to start treating yourself and others with a bit more gentleness, a bit more tenderness and concern, because we're all in the same boat, basically. The Buddha said, all beings desire happiness and recoil from pain. This is universal. You know? 
And when we realise this, it can give us a very beautiful motivation for the practice. So we're not coming at the practice in an attempt to sort of improve ourselves or, you know, kind of make, turn our faults into strengths. I mean, this can happen as a natural result of the practice. But sometimes we're coming at it actually with a little bit of self-hatred or, you know, aversion, that we don't like the way we are or that our lives are and we want to fix that. But when we come motivated by compassion instead, you know, there's a sense of wanting to embrace the suffering yeah, and learning how to actually meet that in a wise and helpful way. Because the, the Buddha said, suffering has to be understood yeah, before you can overcome it. If we don't first meet it, then there can be this wish to kind of transcend it, get away from it, escape from it. And that's called now in psychological terms, premature transcendence or spiritual bypass. And it can happen. I mean, even with people practicing the same methods, one person may practice in a wish to contact what their experiences are and to understand them. Another may contact them wishing to escape. Uh, I had a friend who had a lot of uh, inner hate, you know, through her lifestyle, through her conditioning and events that had happened to her. And she said to me once, I want to transcend myself because I hate myself. And when I heard that, I was really quite shocked. Yeah. Because I thought the whole point was about, you know, learning to develop a good relationship with ourselves. But the thing is, these attitudes that we carry are very subtle, and we don't always see them. And that's why I find a very helpful paradigm to be this idea of the relationship between the observer and the observed, or between the knowing and the known, yeah? It's just a sense that there is a space there, and you can start to notice and become very sensitive to what's going on in that space. And you'll often find, at least I find for myself, that there is sometimes some resistance. And sometimes when you see that, it, that's enough to just be able to let go and realise, OK, I'm not relating to this in a very helpful way. Yeah? Because things arise in the present based on past causes. So you know, now we're tired because maybe some of us have not slept that well or we've had busy family Christmases. So there's a reason for that. Yeah? But we can either react to that by saying, hang on a minute, I'm on a meditation retreat, I need to get my act together, you know, I shouldn't be snoozing in the meditation, or, oh, well, you know, here I am, I'm feeling tired, like, how can I just be with that? You know, what kind of attitudes are, are helpful to be able to just accept and open to that experience of feeling tired? And it's totally allowed to go to sleep during the meditation, you yeah? know? It's okay to lie down as well, especially if you've got backache like I do. But certainly at the lunchtime, I'm going to try and give you a bit of time so that you can rest. Yeah. So that's a general kind of outline of what we're going to be doing in the next three days. And we're going to be looking particularly at the Buddha's definition of what, in, um, what right intention is. And he identified three right attitudes or intentions towards the practice. And so today we're going to start with um, non-ill will or, or non-cruelty, um, which is a synonym for compassion. Yeah, so he called that um, uh, avihimsaka in Pali. And that you may recognize that word. It's quite similar to uh, ahimsa from Mahatma Gandhi. Yeah? So it literally ne means non-violence or non-cruelty. So compassion is the opposite of being cruel. Yeah? We see somebody suffering and we have this natural feeling of wanting to help. Like if you see a child fall into a lake you know, who can't swim, or even a dog fall into a lake, sometimes, you know, it's, it's quite natural to respond to that, you know, and to try and help. So compassion is very connected to suffering. Yeah? It resonates with the suffering of others and the suffering of ourselves, but it also activates in as a wish to alleviate that suffering, and that's why compassion can become a beautiful dwelling place, like a Brahma Vihara. So it can be a sublime abiding and that's because we don't only focus on the suffering, we're connected to the suffering, but there's this wish to look for ways and actively alleviate suffering. Yeah? So when we contact our suffering, we meet it, first of all, through mindfulness. So mindfulness knows the content of the present moment, and it brings that content into focus. Yeah? That's the job of mindfulness. It's like shining a light on something so that we see what's going on. But mindfulness alone is not really enough. It has to first illuminate the situation, the contents, the experience of the present moment. But then along with this kindness or this compassion, it, it, compassion asks, how can I be with this? How can I open my heart to it and relate to it in a way that actually soothes and calms the mind? Yeah? 
So there's a very nice sutta in um, the Buddhist texts. And uh, it's uh, this little yaka, like we have all kinds of little beings in the Buddhist text, devas and yakas and invisible beings. And uh, this little thing comes up to the Buddha and says, uh, oh, he felt very pleased with himself because he thought he'd understood the Buddha's teaching. And he said, um, oh, it's always good for the mindful one. The mindful one dwells in happiness. Better each day for the mindful one. And they are free from enmity. And then the Buddha says, hmm, well, it's always good for the mindful one. The mindful one dwells in happiness. Better each day for the mindful one. But they're not freed from enmity. Yeah? And then he says something like, uh, one who dwells, uh, what is it? One whose heart dwells in harmlessness and has loving kindness for all beings, they are freed from enmity. Yeah? So this points to the fact that mindfulness is not always enough. And if you look at the Buddha's noble path, right intention is the second factor. And from right intention, comes the sila, the right conduct, body, speech, and mind. So these things feed into each other, because obviously if you're motivated by kindness, by compassion, by a wish to non, not harm other beings, yeah, then that naturally leads into good conduct of body and speech. Yeah? So it should come along with every other factor of the path. So a long time before you get into right mindfulness, because it's from the right action, the sila, that we have a chance to start working with the contents of our mind. And that starts to undermine the hindrances so that when we do start to practice, we have some kind of clarity so the mindfulness is already empowered. Yeah? And it includes that kindness. So mindfulness on its own is not enough. A nice um, a simile that Ajahn Brahm talks about is like um, kindfulness. So he puts the mindfulness together with the kindness. And he says, mindfulness is like the light of the sun. And kindness is like the warmth. Yeah, so if you imagine, uh, say, for example, a little fern in the forest, like all curled up, you know, you don't really notice it, it's in the undergrowth, but then mindfulness, the light of the sun comes along and shines on that to illuminate it. But then the warmth of the sun kind of helps it to grow and unfurl and, and start to open up. So in a similar way, we can use our mindfulness as a way to almost channel this kindness, the sense of warmth and and goodwill yeah, towards whatever our experience is. And it helps us to stay with that experience for longer. Because by its nature, compassion, kindness is very pleasant. Yeah? You'll notice straight away if there's a little bit of resistance to something, it just intensifies, say, the physical ache in the body or the emotion. Yeah? So you have the suffering of the ache, but then you have the suffering of not wanting the ache, which is what I call double dukkha, double suffering. Yeah? I think it's um, a psychologist, Christopher Germer, who studied a lot about self-compassion. He came up with this very nice little phrase, what you resist persists. So anytime you resist something, you're already kind of, you're pushing it away. You don't want to see it, you know, and it's going to keep knocking on your door until you're ready to have a look. So this kindness helps to kind of open the doors of the heart and invite these things in. So with kindness, we're, we're learning to extend hospitality to every experience equally, yeah? just as the light and warmth of the sun shine on everything equally. So they're quite impartial. Yeah? So developing this kind of attitude towards our experience means that every situation we encounter can be a, a way to freedom, yeah? just by shifting our perspective. There's a very nice story that I heard about... Um, from the Hasidic tradition, so I guess that's the Jewish tradition, but I'd like to change it to um, a story about nuns, because we don't have many stories about nuns. But it was about how um, these particular nuns started to change their attitude towards each other. So there was this monastery in the, in the Dark Ages, or perhaps even today, where um, there were a few nuns living there, but unfortunately they were all getting quite elderly, and they weren't managing to attract any new recruits. And uh, because of this, they were quite concerned about the future of this place. You know, what would happen to the monastery? Because they were all getting old, dying off. And because of this, the kind of morale had, had slackened. You know, it was, they were a bit down in the dumps and the conduct wasn't great. They started eating at the wrong time of day and eating too many chocolate biscuits when they should be in the meditation hall and, you know, chatting when they should be observing silence and... And so they sort of spoke together and said, what are we going to do? And um, one of them decided to speak to the 
the chief nun of the area of the district and ask for some advice. So they went to this nun and they said, you know, this is the situation where nobody's attracted to living the monastic life anymore. Maybe our days are numbered. And she said, well, I don't really have any advice for you. I can't really say what you should do, but just remember that the Buddha is among you. And they thought, huh? Who's the Buddha? The Buddha's among us? That's really strange. I mean, one thing that one of my first teachers told me is to look upon everybody on any meditation retreat as future Buddhas, right? Because we don't know, actually, how far along the path we are. We don't know who is at what stage on the path or, you know, basically, if we're walking on the path, we're going to get to the point where we are enlightened, right? And so these nuns thought, hmm, that's really strange, but we can't dismiss her word. So they went back to the monastery and, and you know, shared the news. And they started looking at at each other very differently. So suddenly they were looking at kind of the lazy nun in the corner having a snooze during the lunch break, and they thought, well, you know, we've thought that she's really lazy, but maybe she's just really relaxed. Maybe she's got no more work to do. You know, she's finished. She's enlightened already. Perhaps we should start to, you know, treat her a bit differently. And then they looked at the bossy nun, you know, who was always telling everybody else what to do, and they thought, well, maybe she's just there to teach us. Maybe she actually has some good advice that we should listen to. You know, And then that really cranky person who was always criticising everybody else, they were thinking, hmm, can't be them, that's impossible. But hang on a minute, what if they were put there just to test us, you know, just for that extra challenge so that we too could like develop patience, develop compassion? Maybe they're actually enlightened, maybe they're the Buddha. And slowly, slowly, you know, when they realised this, they thought, well, they started treating each other differently. They started seeing their faults, what they'd previously seen as faults, as perhaps qualities, perhaps even strengths. You know? and, and their whole attitude towards each other changed. And slowly, slowly, you know, the morale started to lift. There was much more joy, there was a feeling of gratitude, a feeling we wanted to serve one another. And, of course, people started getting attracted and asking if they could come, you know, maybe also join the monastic life. So they started getting youngsters coming in and the whole monastery started to flourish. And the moral of that was just that they started to look at each other anew, with kindly eyes. I always love this phrase, looking upon each other with kindly eyes. There's a story in the suttas as well about that, about three monks who lived together, regarding each other with kindly eyes. And the Buddha praised them and asked them about their meditation. And and they said, well, we're all doing quite well in our meditation. And he said, there's no wonder, you know, because you're treating each other, you're regarding each other with this loving kindness, with this sense of compassion, wanting to serve each other. So we all have sort of this kind of intention in our daily life and towards others. But I think it's much harder sometimes to direct that towards ourselves and also towards our mental states. What if we could look upon our own mind with kindly eyes? You know, what if we could see our own faults, so-called faults, in a different light? You know, that restlessness, maybe that's because you've been busy. Give yourself a break. You know, we're running around like crazy. I mean, you can't expect that when you stop and meditate that everything becomes quiet straight away. It doesn't, you know, it takes time. So what you're observing are just the results of the activities you've been doing previously. But what you can do is relate to it with kindness. You know, and it's in the present moment that we create our future. So it's the way we regard experience. A lovely word that Ajahn Brahm uses sometimes is to create an armistice with your mind. And I had a look at what that word meant, and it's um, defined as a, um, a temporary ceasefire while a solution for lasting peace is found. Yeah, Isn't that lovely? So it's like you notice that space between you and the object, and you realize that in there you can put some peace, you can put some kindness, and that temporarily creates peace. Yeah, Whatever the mind inclines to becomes the character of the mind. You know, The more we think a certain way the more that becomes natural. So the good news is, you know, that our minds are conditioned, but they're also malleable. We can recondition. Yeah? We can make good karma right in this moment by the way we react and respond and relate to our experience. Yeah? So everything is not predestined, circumscribed, no hope, fated to be this way forever. But of course you have to be careful because this isn't a a deal. It's not that I'll be kind to it so that it calms down. yeah. Because the mind can be very tricky and you start to negotiate. Okay, If I look at it this way, then it will change and I'll I'll have the experience I want to have. 
It's more about opening the heart gradually, very gradually and very gently, to be able to meet more and more of the difficult experiences as well. Yeah, to shed light on these experiences which are painful and which do cause maybe even some fear to arise. Yeah, and I always think it's very important to go gently. Yeah, so you can use your mind in different ways. Sometimes we notice something arising, whether an emotion or a feeling in the body, and we feel like the mind's strong enough just to look at that up front, yeah? to go straight into the pain or to go straight into the emotion because we feel resourced, we feel strong enough. Yeah? But other times we feel a little bit you know, vulnerable or maybe we haven't quite settled into our body, settled into the space, and we feel like a little bit fragile. So then it might be better to just widen the awareness and have a generalised kind of sense of the body and the mind and not to focus on the difficult things. It's like if you were scared of water but you wanted to learn to swim. Yeah? You'd first of all like just put your toe in the water. Right? You wouldn't just plunge straight in. And then when you felt comfortable with that, you might get in up to your thighs or, yeah, and then your waist. And then gradually, gradually, when you felt able, you might try to float and then gradually learn to swim. But you wouldn't push yourself, right? So also, we don't plunge straight into the most difficult areas of our mind and our experience. <coughs> but we learn to approach them with a, a kind of attitude of warmth, curiosity, but also respect. You know, one sort of part of the attention should always be on how you're feeling with whatever's arising and really respect your limits. Yeah? So don't just open up everything completely. So this is all about a mind which is soft and malleable and adaptive. And these uh, cultivations of compassion, loving kindness, they help to make the mind soft and, uh, and see a bigger picture. Yeah. So the problem is when we're too fixed to our experience, something arises and we immediately respond. There's like no gap in there. But when you have a gap and you can widen that gap, then you have some ability to know what to put in there and how to handle things in a kinder way. Yeah. The Buddha was always called the great compassionate one. So this is one of the factors that you need to carry all the way through the path. You know, this beautiful, compassionate way of responding. But also it's an indication of somebody's wisdom. You know, a wise person can't be uh, measured by their knowledge, by what they know, but more by the way they treat others, the way they make you feel. You know, that's when you know you're in the presence of someone safe, someone wise. So it has to manifest. Yeah. It has to actually manifest in this beautiful emotional warmth and sense of safety. So we cultivate this from the beginning. And the Buddha said, you know, whatever you frequently ponder on, that becomes the inclination of the mind. It becomes your character. Yeah. So that whatever arises, you can just have a little bit of influence and, and learn to relate more kindly, more gently. And in my own experience, I just realized that you can never be too gentle and kind. Yeah. At first, what you think is kindness and gentleness is still a little bit of manipulation and you know, wanting things to be different. But bit by bit, you realise that actually when you get a bit more courage, you can really step back and just let the process unfold. Yeah, Because sometimes the mind has a lot of intelligence and it knows what to do mm -hmm. and how to respond. So we learn to trust the process. Yeah. So I just wanted to talk a little <coughs> bit about... Um, the five hindrances as well, because uh, mindfulness is always considered to be a kind of bare awareness that just brings the content of experience into focus, but in a very objective way, without proliferation or judgment, yeah? without bias. So just to be purely aware. And I always think that that is a little bit of a, a hard ask, as long as these five hindrances are operating. So one way that you can see the whole practice of, of Buddhism is ways and means to start overcoming what we call the five hindrances. And I, I'm guessing not everybody knows what they are, but um, they basically include any kind of aversion or ill will, yeah, anything negative in the mind, that, a sort of sense of wanting to push things away. And then the opposite of that is desire or craving, wanting, so grasping at pleasant, the pleasant, yeah? And then also doubt is one of the hindrances, not really knowing what's going on or not quite being sure that this is the correct instruction to the extent where you're not even able to really practice and stay focused on anything very much. And then the other one is restlessness, yeah, or restlessness and worry, it's sometimes called. 
So it's also a kind of aversion to what's happening in the moment. We don't like it, so we want to run away from it, escape from it. Yeah, so the mind becomes very restless and agitated, or we become worried about something because we're not quite sure what's happening in the mind. And then the last one is um, what, what is traditionally called sloth and torpor, a very old-fashioned way of saying tiredness and sluggishness of the mind. So that's when the mind, again, can't really be present. It can't really stay with the experience. And this one is not to be worried about too much, because often what we think is sloth and torpor is just physical exhaustion. So I would say if this comes up for you, just try to relax with it and go with it. Yeah? But these five hindrances, the Buddha said, are things which obscure wisdom. So they actually prevent clear seeing. And they also nourish delusion. So, for example, when you have anger in your mind, you, know, you might meet a person that previously was a friend or even a partner. But because something's changed in your relationship, now whenever you see them, this anger comes up. And at that moment, it completely obscures the truth so that all you can see are the things that trigger your anger. Yeah? You can only see that this person's selfish and mean and not very kind and they never do the things they say they're going to do. But when you were together with them in the past, you saw the whole person. Right? So what's changed? So when we have anger, we tend to see things through a very biased lens. It's like everything's coloured red. And you can only see those things that fuel that anger. Yeah? And the same when we have desire. Yeah? We don't see a person as, for example, our brother or father or sister. We see them as an object. Suddenly they become very dehumanised in a way. And we only see those things that stimulate that desire. So these mean that mindfulness is not really bare and objective because as long as these five hindrances are operating, they bend and distort things. And the other trouble is that we're conditioned, right? So we don't really have very objective awareness. Awareness will be different in different cultures. You know, some things in our culture that we think of as rude, in other cultures are just being straightforward or being, you know, like saying, pass me the salt. I always remember the first time I left England and went to Israel, it was actually quite lovely because there people just said, give me this, give me that. And I was like, oh, oh, they're quite sort of abrupt. But then I realized that was just the way they speak. It, and it wasn't considered rude at all. Whereas here, there are so many P's and Q's. It's sometimes so confusing, whether it's the P or the Q or the next P. How many Q's you've already said? <laughs> Is that right, P's and Q's? Is that right? What does that stand for? Please and, oh, please and thank you. Okay, please and thank you. <laughs> I get confused by English manners all the time. So, you know, these things are very conditioned. I mean, for example, if somebody's been told from childhood, which I think a lot of men in particular are, that it's a sign of weakness to cry or to show emotion, then it may be that when you contact feelings of you know, pain or wanting to just weep, you know, feelings of sorrow, that you're so programmed to feel that that's not accepted that it immediately sort of turns into perhaps a kind of anger or you know, perhaps a kind of feeling of just closing down. Yeah, because we can't allow those feelings to come up. So it's very difficult to have objective awareness as long as these hindrances are operating. And the whole path of Buddhism is teaching us how to gradually, gradually overcome these. So one of the lovely um, paradigms in the teaching is called the gradual training. And it starts with this beautiful right motivation, understanding that all beings desire happiness. Even beings who are going about it in really what to us seem like very unwise ways, very harmful ways, they're still coming from a wish to be happy. You know? And generally speaking, people make decisions based on good intentions. They think it's for the best, maybe of only <coughs> themselves, but still, they are doing things you know, with the best of intentions, just perhaps misguided. So, first of all, you know, when we're coming at practice with the right intention, then we're we're able to relate to things in a wise way that leads to freedom rather than leads to rejection and aversion. And then that naturally, as I was saying, leads into wise ways of relating to each other. And one of the areas I think that's really important is learning how to develop right speech and not only abstaining from lying, abstaining from you know, um, malicious speech and gossip and fault-finding, but also the opposites of speaking in ways that uplift the mind, that divide people who are, that, sorry, that unite people who are divided, that bring people together in friendship. You know? So instead of saying, oh, do you see what this person did? You know, I don't think that's very good, blah, blah, blah. You know, actually trying to say things which promote friendship and unity. 
and, and really just creating this sense of harmlessness through our speech. So this starts to undermine the hindrances because we're not you know, constantly reinforcing negative patterns that create suffering for ourselves and others. And, and so the Buddha says that even at this level of, of right conduct, we can get a kind of happiness which he called a blameless bliss. So the whole idea of this is that when the hindrances start to decrease, more happiness becomes available to us. You know, we put down some of the suffering, and it's natural then that there's a sense of um, non-remorse, yeah, non-regret, and a sense that you're on the right path, that somehow your behavior, your lifestyle is aligned to what you really the deepest, the most beautiful of your intentions and, and values. Yeah? So a certain happiness comes along with that. And then the Buddha goes further and says, look at the way you're using your mind. So there's a kind of mental sealer, which he calls a mental virtue, which he calls sense restraint. And that's learning to look at things, look at life, look at other people in a way that leads to wholesome states increasing and unwholesome states reducing. Because yeah? so often the way we look just makes us suffer. You know, we can watch the news and just keep watching the news and keep hearing all the depressing stuff that's happening. And it's just, if you, if you look at the effect that's having, I mean, it's not really helping you to be proactive in the world and to bring forth something different. So we have to be really aware of the way we're relating and try to look at things from a different angle. Yeah? And then he says that when you do that, the, hun- the hindrances start to be undermined and then there's a chance to start to be more aware. And from that awareness from general mindfulness and daily life, we have a chance to start to meditate and and calm the mind down. So we've already done a lot of work before we even come to the cushion. So this is how, you know, the practice becomes something to apply in daily life. (coughs) So that by the time we come into the meditation, the mind's already overcome the coarsest of our defilements, if you like. I still haven't found a better word for that because it sounds too much like sin to me. But the kind of the the aspects of the mind that causes us cause us to suffer, yeah. So the things that we'd rather not have going on in our mind that we know are unwholesome and that don't help us and that don't help others, <coughs> these start to reduce and we start to become able to have a little bit more influence over the way we perceive, so that wholesome states can flourish in our mind. Yeah. And it's only at this point in the suttas that the Buddha says you should seek a secluded place to practice yeah so then you already made peace quite a lot with your own mind you know how to relate to it in a fairly wise way and then you've just got some of the subtler hindrances to meditation to overcome and the way we overcome these is by getting into the deeper meditations whether through the satipatthana sutta looking at the body the mind the mental contents and becoming aware of what's happening or I mean, it's the same route, but some people start with that or some people go straight into what we call samadhi practices of calming the mind. So that's when we maybe take one object, like the breath or like maybe meditation on loving kindness or compassion, and we stay with that one object for long enough that the mind gets really unified with that and starts to really calm down and the mindfulness becomes very empowered. Yeah. So you start to realize that the more you put down, the more... Energy and happiness is available to the mind because you've let go of so many um, distractions, if you like, and so many kind of so much complexity and um, and diversity. So the mind starts to become much more unified with one object, yeah. And the mind starts to settle and become very bright, very aware. And it's at this point the Buddha says that you have a chance to see things as they really are, because the mind is free from bias, free from wanting it to be a certain way, not wanting it to be another way. So that's when you actually have the chance to see things like impermanence, to see that there's no inherently existing self in here, you know, that that is sort of timeless and changeless, and that basically we're a conditioned process. And to see things like suffering, and to look at it in the eye, you know, there is suffering, and suffering is to be understood. It's very hard to see that when we're already suffering. First, we need to develop a sense of well-being, you know, and resourcefulness in order to see that. So there's been even some psychological studies that show that when you um, uh, practice mindfulness and compassion together, it actually increases a sense of resilience to suffering. So you become more attuned to it, but you also become more resilient, more resourced to be able to handle it and to stay with it, and more altruistic which I think is really interesting. 
Because when they did the study with the pure mindfulness group, they found that they were more sensitized to suffering, but not necessarily more resilient or, or um, any more altruistic. Yeah. So this compassion has a sense of emotional warmth which nourishes the mind, which makes us feel strong, stable, able to penetrate things which we may not want to see. Yeah? So it helps us to overcome these hindrances to seeing clearly and have a, a, a chance to gain deeper insight. And insight's always something we haven't yet seen. You know, Sometimes we think we understand impermanence, that we can see everything's arising and passing. But there's something we haven't seen if we had seen it, we'd be enlightened already. You know, we'd never take anything to be permanent again. We'd never get deluded by the events in life. <laughs> and and basically, yeah, there would still be suffering, but there would be no sense of a, a person in here which is suffering and that I need to fix, I need to change. Yeah. So it's, it, insight's always something we haven't yet seen. And the deeper we can go into the practice and into calming the mind through compassion, through the right attitude, the more chance we have to see those truths that the Buddha saw. Yeah. And of course, when he'd seen those, then he was designated the great compassionate one. Not only the... I mean, of course, he was known for his wisdom, but I find it interesting that the great compassionate one was his most um, popular, I don't know. That's, that, that was what he was more known by than anything else. Yeah. So, enough of the introduction. So today will be on mainly compassion. And I thought we could start with a little bit of meditation. Um, and I'll give some guidance for that. And that will take us about, uh, for about 40 minutes. So if you want to just have a quick stretch, especially the people who haven't meditated before, or a toilet break if you need to. <coughs> 